Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for Full Story Live. I'm your host, Melanie Chrissy, and we are recording live from the beautiful Full Story studio here at HQ4 in sunny, hot Atlanta, Georgia. And I am thrilled to be here with Agata Bugai. Agata is a head of the product management practice here at Full Story. And um, just a little bit of light housekeeping to know what you're jumping into today. So this is our third and final session in a series on product management that we've been doing on LinkedIn Live over the last couple of weeks. All of these sessions are recorded, so you can review the old ones on YouTube um, or on the Full Story channel. And this one will be recorded and the transcript will be up on the blog after. So if you need to duck out, have lunch, do your thing, um, all of this will be available for you later. And we are live, live for real. <laughs> so this only works if you give us your questions, your suggestions, your ideas, your banter, your reaction emojis, your live tweet storm, you know, like bring it. I've got um, a great team from Full Story here that are going to help me get those questions from LinkedIn to my space phone. So our agenda is we're going to do quick inter uh, introductions. We're going to talk, uh, just discuss about the topic for the day, which is friction. And then we're going to go straight to your questions that you've sent over. So participate, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, so if you're just joining us, again, my name is Melanie Chrissy. I am a product marketing manager here at Full Story. I was a Full Story customer for several years before joining the company about two and a half years ago. Um, and I am just really grateful to be in the room with you, Agata. Agata is a leader here. Agata, introduce yourself, tell everybody a little bit about your experience. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thanks so much for um, having me, Melanie. It's, it's, it's super fun to be here. Um, so yes, my name is Agata. I'm on the product uh, management team here at Full Story. I've been at Full Story um, a little bit less than you. <laughs> I've been here about seven months. It's crazy how quickly time wow. flies. Um, Only but it's seven been, months. Yeah, I feel crazy. like it's been so long. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's uh, it's been amazing. Um, and actually, my, my path to product management, I would say, was a very uh, long and windy road, if you will. Um, I actually started my career as a software engineer, and I loved what I was doing, but I oftentimes found myself asking questions like, why are we building this? And who is this for? And what are the goals that they're trying to achieve? And what's happening in the market? And so um, I found myself uh, doing some soul searching. And I thought, you know, I really am interested in this thing called product management. I didn't know much about it. Um, and so I, again, took sort of a, a long and windy road to get into product. I went to business school. I spent some time doing consulting and then ultimately made it to product and absolutely love it. Um, have been here ever since. Uh, and I actually spent, prior to joining Full Story, spent almost six years at Home Depot uh, working um, primarily on the, the site experience and the product management team. So I'm um, super excited to, to be in product and to talk to you about friction because it's such an important topic. Um, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Friction <laughs> is like super near and dear to my heart. I'm actually kind of self-conscious about it. I was um, like recently accused of delivering a friction-based onboarding, and I'm like processing what that is like not what I meant to do. So I'm processing that. So I'm really, really excited to talk about it today, um, and kind of learn with you. But so just to get grounded for anybody who's joining the call, who maybe what is what is friction? So can we talk about what do we talk about when we talk about friction? Can you define it at a really high level? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I love it that we're starting there, right? Because you have to define the thing first before you talk about it. Um, so friction is basically any time that your customers are trying to do something, they have a goal in mind, and they're unable to achieve that goal. They're not able to do the thing that they want to do, which oftentimes is actually the thing that we want them to do also, right? Mm -hmm. So as an example, um, I mean, I guess I would say, take a step back, two high level buckets of friction. Um, there's the, we've built something and it's not the experience that enables our customers to complete their goal. So a great example of this would be, you know, customers trying to check out and for the mm -hmm. life of them, they just can't, they keep getting some error message and they just cannot move forward. That's friction. That's very, you know, what I, I like to call that frustration. The experience yeah. exists and it's just frustrating. Something's not working. The, there's another bucket of friction um, that's really just around opportunity identification, right? It's a customer is trying to do something and they're using your product in a, some workflow mm -hmm. and your product just hasn't yet evolved to the point where it can help them. So a great example of this might be, um, you know, you're, let's say you're planning a trip and, you know, it's like two days before and you, you know, take your suitcase out of the closet and you're like, oh, I forgot this thing is broken. The zipper doesn't work for some reason, right? And you're like, well, I, gosh, I don't actually have time to, to, to go to the store and buy a new suitcase. Right. Gosh, I wish, 
I wish I knew if you know this you know favorite retailer X Y Z um, was able to deliver me the suitcase of my dreams within you know before I leave for my trip. And if they had that information on the site, they knew you, you mm. knew that it was in stock, um, and you knew that you could get it. You may you, you maybe knew how much you had to pay to get it before the time that you leave because there's a cost that you associated with that or a value rather. Um, if you had that information, you could make a decision. You could you could reach your goal of making sure you had your suit, this is a terrible example, but, yes. <laughs> but you know, that you have a suitcase that you can take with you, right? Right. So that would be sort of a, what I would call a, an opportunity, um, not so much yes. frustration, but your product could evolve if you have a, a site you know, that sells suitcases, for instance, your product could evolve to a state where it could you know, meet your needs. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I can think of like so many real examples. So we're we're gonna be thinking a little bit about like e-commerce examples, like shopping is a good example, but sometimes like SaaS products. But in e-com, like I think about the difference between um, your search takes too many steps for me to get the results I want, the filtering is too hard, versus like your site has no search on it at all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, but there's also, um, and I'm totally biased, my background is in performance, so I really care about like speed. So there's also this aspect of, aspect of friction which could be like lagginess or slowness, right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe you designed it or the opportunity is met and it's there, but it's just taking too long, yeah. right? So how do we think about solving for those types of friction? Yeah, absolutely, and that's an, a great example of that, what I would call that frustration type of friction. Mm -hmm. like you've, you've built the thing, but it's just not meeting the need. Got right? it. Because it's just taking too long, and the thing is spinning, and, 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 and things like that. So it falls in um, the first bucket, because yeah, that, it's just not say. working as designed, even and, though it's there. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> but you know, it's interesting, you mentioned bucket, and then you also mentioned kind of how do we think about prioritizing friction. Um, those actually go very hand in hand, and, and what I mean by that is, any strong product team is going to have a, a what I call a diverse or balanced backlog of things right. that they're working on, right? And I think about it in buckets. There's the bucket of work that you do to you know drive revenue. There's the bucket of work that you do to reduce costs. There's the bucket of work um, around you know uh, driving CSAT up, so customer mm -hmm. satisfaction, right? Delight. There's the bucket of work um, that really gets at you know technical performance and infrastructure work and making sure that your product is healthy. And you have these different buckets of work. And you, you, know, you realize that you need to be doing all those things to have a product that not only maximizes business value, but also customer delight. And so when you think about, well, gosh, how would I actually prioritize something that you know, maybe is performance related versus, hey, this feature that I know is going to drive revenue, in an ideal situation, you actually don't have to trade off between the two, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's not an exact science. It's not like you can say, hey, 20% of my time every single week is going to be here or there. But you right. kind of have this idea of, this is directionally the types of work that we should be doing. And so then when it gets to, let's say you have a bucket, um, and you know, how teams define buckets is, you know, there, there's definitely some, um, uh, how do I put this? There's no exact science, but the team has to get together and figure out what are the buckets that we're going to um, you know, sort of slot our work into. And if you have a bucket that's all around, hey, you know, maybe it's performance issues, mm -hmm. or maybe it's uh, you know, defects or bugs or whatnot, then you're prioritizing against sort of, you're comparing apples to apples in that case. Right. You're saying, you know, we know we need to spend some percentage of our capacity making the site more performant, right? Mm -hmm. These are the things that we could do to address that. Which one's going to give us the most value from a business standpoint as well as from a customer standpoint, right? So that's ideally the trade-off that you would actually just need to make. Yeah, yeah, I think that trade-off in value is, I think, where I always get so stuck, mm -hmm. where I'm just like, you know, and so kind of going back, uh, taking a step back, we've talked a little bit about prioritizing friction, but even in order to prioritize it, you have to identify that it exists. Mm -hmm. So what are the tools and like processes that you follow to just know that friction's happening in the wild? That's, a, that's such a good question. Um, there are multiple ways, right? And some of it goes back to, well, what type of friction are you actually able to identify? Mm -hmm. The first thing that I love to do when I get into a new space um, is uh, it's a good old journey map. <laughs> as basic as that is, it's the, you know, what a journey map does is it really enables you to understand your customer and what are the things that they are doing today that either help them or make things harder for them. Mm -hmm. and, and so at the highest level, you identify areas of opportunity where your product could slot in, right? So as an example, if I'm, this, again, we're, we're gonna use the same terrible example, but we started there, so we're just gonna continue. <laughs> we're I'm really attached to the suitcase. <laughs> yeah, let, let's say that I let's am suitcase.com. <laughs> yes. Terrible example. Um, Free startup it, idea. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, right? I need to understand when customers come to my site, mm -hmm. what are they looking, what are the goals that they're trying to achieve, right? And so going out and identifying what are my personas, who are, you know, who are my customers, what are the personas, and what are the key um, areas of the workflow um, 
and, and where do they expect me to slot in or where, where do they want me to slot in or hell, where, where could I slot myself in? It's really, really important. So that's a very good qualitative way of identifying those sort of areas of opportunity, right? Um, when it comes to, but there are also quantitative ways, right? Mm -hmm. So let's assume that I am suitcase.com and I know that, uh, so I have a lot of analytics and tracking and things like that. And I know that my sort of cart to order is a certain percentage, right? Mm -hmm. If I have the proper you know, analytics setup and the dashboarding and all that stuff, when things dip, right? When, when defects get introduced or the you know, performance issues arise, if I have the right tracking setup and the right alerting, right, I can actually be notified or be aware that, yeah. th that there's some sort of friction that the site, the thing that we've built isn't doing what we intended for it to do based mm -hmm. on the things that we know today, right? Um, so that's sort of a quantitative way that you can identify identify friction. Um, of course, I have to mention that there are tools like Full Story um, that actually can can play in both buckets. And what I mean by that is, you know, like we've defined, as you very well know, and have used in the past, sort of like our frustration heuristics, right? So right. we can identify if someone is, um, for lack of a better word, expressing negative sentiment yeah. um, towards an experience by you know because they're they're rage, rage clicking, clicking right? Yeah. All, right. So. So we can identify that, right? Or we could say, hey, you know what? We want to look at customers who are going from cart to order to see what that experience looks like and actually you know, qualitatively also be, become aware of opportunities um, that, that you know, we could go after. So yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that. And I've like seen you do this in real life. I feel yeah. like, like the journey map is something that everyone talks about. And I think until we started working together, I didn't know what the deliverable was, mm -hmm. you know? And so like, we're talking about the research to actually make an artifact so you can understand why is somebody even on suitcase.com, you know? But then your product, your website, you have all these analytics, you have maybe something like Full Story that's gonna alert you when friction goes up so you can proactively kind of keep an eye on that as well. Mm -hmm. I, I love, I think you really have to have both. Mm -hmm. Like if you were just gonna have analytics or something like Full Story and you don't have the research to understand mm -hmm. uh, the story behind the data, yeah. you know, you're going to be in a bad spot. Um, so I do want to just take a second. We've been chatting for a minute. <laughs> if you're just joining us, this is Full Story Live, um, a LinkedIn Live series. We're talking about friction today um, and product management. And so send your questions over. I think I'm going to ask you like one more question and then we'll do live Q&A. So if you have an idea or some friendly banter or comment, <laughs> like get it in because we're going to that section soon. Um, so Last thing I want to ask is, okay, so like, so maybe we've identified, we've identified a problem, we've prioritized the problem, so we even know, okay, we have bandwidth this week, we're going to work on it, mm -hmm. and maybe it doesn't move the needle when you fix it. Mm -hmm. So like, what happened? How do you, how do you go back and figure out what went wrong when you're trying to fix the friction and the fix isn't working? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, I think the the first thing that you have to identify is why where you're not able to move the needle, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, to, to me, it, buckets, there, there are two buckets and in, in how I think about that. The first one is around, did we actually identify the problem correctly mm -hmm. as well as the, the success criteria, right? So, you know, anytime you've identified an opportunity, that you have some inputs that suggest that that's something that you should do, right? So for instance, right. going back to the cart to order example, right? Potentially cart to order dips, right? And you go, oh, okay, well, we're seeing this, this gap in, in sort of this, this KPI. And so we've identified an opportunity and now we're going to go ahead and, and solve it. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that, you define your success criteria to say, hey, if we build this thing, we expect, you know, cart to order to go up by 20, 30 bips, whatever it is, yeah. right? So there's the problem identification um, and the data that goes behind that. Then there's the actually the, the thing that we built, the solution, right? Um, and, and it's possible that we actually didn't build the right thing, that we identified the right opportunity and, su and success criteria, but the solution just wasn't, um, wasn't what it needs to be. So the path that you take is going to depend on which bucket you land in, right? So this one is all around, this is bucket number one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I talk with my hands about really just <laughs> validating, <both> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> confirming, confirming yeah. that you're going after the right thing and you're measuring correctly. And so that goes right. into like making sure the analytics is set up correctly, that your dashboarding is set up correctly, that you've maybe didn't miss an input or made some assumption that actually ended up being false. And then here you go into under, but let's assume that you did this correctly, right? So then yeah. you go into the solution. So then it's just a matter of understanding well, why why didn't it actually move the needle? And so what I love to do is. Um, Watch sessions, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah. I was like, do I say it or not? Yeah, like, yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm not here to sell, but but watching sessions, I mean, is one really great way to understand what a customer is doing. 
at the same time, just talking to customers, right? So maybe as simple as you know, leaning over and saying, "Hey, can you use this and, and experience and tell me what you think?" Or or doing like a hallway usability test or or something else, and just getting some really really quick feedback yeah. to see if it's something obvious, or maybe if you just need to do a lot more research um, to understand why the thing that you built isn't actually solving the problem. So, Tot totally, yeah. I'm like like this just like like lights a uh, fire of shame in my heart. Like I want to share really quick. So this happened to me. Like with the onboarding flow for Full Story, we we had our success criteria. We wanted to optimize for people getting Full Story installed. So we actually had that part right, and we had the right dashboard set up to see how are they getting installed. But it was the solution that we got wrong, and the um, the way we caught it was not only by watching sessions, but also listening to our support team. So our huggers here at Full mm -hmm. Story caught it, and then I was able to go uh, quantify it with Full mm -hmm. Story with the session data. And what it actually was was like we tried to introduce like a one-click installation option but it required like your browser pop-ups to be on and like so everyone who tried to click that option failed and it was just like ah I'm so glad like I can't even imagine how long that would have taken mm -hmm. me to catch if one customers weren't really um, generous in giving their feedback mm -hmm. to me um, but two if we didn't actually have the the tool to be able to see how many people yeah. are going down this path to yeah. failure um, so I, I think that's that's perfect I, this is why I think this stuff is so important so okay so I I want to I want to check the doc and um, just here on my my fancy glitter space phone here to see if anything's come in. Um, we do have the, okay. So there's one question that I definitely want to make sure we address. It came in before the talk even started, and that's is there such a thing as good friction? Uh, and <laughs> what do you think about that? Great. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I'm going to actually answer this um, in, in multiple ways. So one, as a product practitioner, yeah. um, but also just as a, a user of the internet. Um, so you know, as a, as a product practitioner, you, you never want to create an experience that's going to irritate a customer, frustrate them, make them you know, unhappy, right? right? So full stop, right? That's not, our, not, not the intent it's not at the all. not the goal. <laughs> However, <laughs> that's right, that's not the goal. However, I would say also as a product practitioner, anytime you get any input, that helps you propel the product forward, that's a good input, okay. right? So if I take that lens, like <laughs> feedback is a gift, right? Mm. And so, um, so from that sense, I would say yes, absolutely, friction, understanding where friction exists is a really, really good thing from a, from a product practitioner standpoint. As a user of the internet, I would say that there are absolutely times where friction is, is a terrible thing and there's no way to, to, to spin it in a positive way, but I would say plenty of times also when friction really helps slow the user down in a way that's really valuable and meaningful to them. So as an mm -hmm. example, um, if you're uh, you know, agreeing to something as part of like an authentic, like a sign up flow, like right. you want to be reminded of what you're signing up for as an example. So like a modal pops up, it's like, are you sure that you want to, you know, yes, please yes. thank you for reminding me, right? Um, or <laughs> I forget my passwords all the time. Um, and you know, if I'm going to get log locked out after three attempts, please tell me yes. because then I'll just I'll take a minute and I'll think about it, and then and then I'll try to remember uh, my password. You know, I'll, I'll put a little bit more effort into it. Yeah. Um, and so that's really helpful. It stops me in my tracks. But it's really there to help me, and so I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, that like really helpful form feedback, because otherwise I really am gonna just like convince myself I remember what my password is or just type it wrong and try to cram it in. Exactly. The, the other one I think about that I think has saved my but a lot is like where they slow you down when you want to delete something. Mm, it's like, yeah. okay, you're going to delete this. It's not going in the archive trash can so yeah. you can revisit it later. It's gone forever. Yeah. Like <laughs> we're going to make you like sign your name, give us your passport and type delete the exact element, yeah. <laughs> you know, cause it's like, they don't want you to get in that situation where you deleted something you need. So slow UX exactly. um, definitely has a place in design and I think can be part of a delightful experience, yeah. uh, exactly. even though it can be friction in that moment. Yeah. Um, okay. So so going back to data, I, I think this is one where I really, I feel like it's a weak spot for me. So I'm kind of like asking to learn. But <laughs> So how do you know when you have enough data to make a decision about the friction you're trying to solve? Like yeah. otherwise, I feel like I could just research in a corner for like yeah. months and never yeah. be confident enough to say, you yeah. got it. That, that's, a, that's a good question. I would say at the highest level, it depends a lot on how much effort or investment will it take to do the thing that you potentially are going to do with that information? So as an example, if you have one or two customers that email you and say something like, hey, the, the text on this button doesn't feel right. It, it, it seems mm. like you're using the wrong words. 
um, you know, you can take that piece of feedback, you could take a look at the, the text and the button, and you could say, oh gosh, you know what, they're right. That is, that is, we have introduced friction unintentionally. That's gonna take me a minute to fix, and you'll just go and do it, right? Yeah. And so you just, you just need one or two pieces of feedback, right? Um, and you go with your gut, and, and, and you're done, right? Yeah. However, if you're going after an opportunity that's going to take, call it 10 people for nine months, you're making a massive investment. And you know, at that point, you likely don't know how you're gonna solve for the opportunity, right? You haven't gotten there yet, but you know, you know enough that it's going to be a massive investment. And so you, you, you better make sure that you're looking at a lot of different inputs um, and a lot of different data points um, so that you can feel pretty good about making that investment. Because that just, yeah, that's how I would think about yeah. it. And that makes sense. So it's like proportional to the amount of resources or people you need to mobilize, which I, I guess is just kind of common sense, just out of respect for people's time and, and the risk that you're putting into it. Yeah, I mean, sunk cost. exactly. Time is money, right? And so <laughs> yeah. if you're going to invest a lot of time, um, you have to make sure that you feel good about the decision that you're making. Um, totally. I will also say that um, I think also with time and with experience, you get better at kind of understanding what inputs really matter and which mm. ones matter less. And so you may actually get to a place where you know, call it 10 years ago, you would have needed, this, I'm simplifying this, you would have needed 10 inputs to feel pretty good about a decision. But you've, you've learned enough where that you can take a few shortcuts and maybe now you only need four, but you've already invested you know, over the last yeah. however many years in getting those different inputs. And so th there's a little bit of that as well, I'd say. Okay, so now that makes me want to ask you something else, which I know you're going to hate that I'm asking this because we <laughs> agreed we weren't going to talk about it before we walked in the room. But like, is that a case for experimentation? A hundred percent. Like, so, sometimes you just need to prove to yourself that it's right. Like, maybe you run an experiment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, I am the biggest fan of A-B testing okay. um, as one form of experimentation. And so, absolutely, I think that there are, uh, there are definitely times when you should be A-B testing um, where you don't have enough data, you don't have enough inputs, um, and we're really just putting something out there in the wild and letting customers kind of tell you uh, is, a, is, a, is a really, really great, great thing to have. So number one fan of A-B testing, for sure. For yeah, sure. I think what makes me scared about it is like sometimes the amount of work, like you really have to invest in developing two really good experiences in order to experiment without dropping the ball. You know, so yeah. that almost like doubles the risk sometimes in terms of like what you're putting in just to find out which one works. So yeah. that's such a tricky thing. No, for sure. And I think sometimes it also comes down to, well, but what if you invest in this thing and it's the wrong thing to invest in? Right. Right. So then you, you, you at least find out earlier, right? Um, that's true. So it's, and, and you can set up A-B tests in different ways too, such that you can actually minimize the level of effort up front. So for instance, you could do things like fake door tests, right? Where right. you don't actually build the thing, yes. but you get enough insight that, that customers want the thing that you're looking to build, right? So there are, because you're right, like you definitely, you don't want to spend too much of an effort building the A-B test if you actually, if there are other things that you could do. So that there are ways to, totally. to get at some of that, for sure. And I feel like that's such a good strategy in marketing as well. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just like test demand for something. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think there's like a, a great thing I've seen happen here in Atlanta where people will make a landing page for a SaaS product or a B2C product even way before they've started building it just to collect emails and see yeah. if people are interested. So yeah. the fake door, I'm a big fan of the fake doors. <laughs> I'm always curious to know what's behind the fake door. Um, so we only have a couple minutes left. I do want to just kind of transition the conversation back to product management at large and just see um, you know, if you have any comments you want to share about what it's like to work in product management at Full Story and what people can do if they're interested in maybe uh, getting in on the fun. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I think that uh, it's, it's amazing to work in product management at Full Story. I think we have such a great team um, here it, as a whole. And then if I think about the, those folks that we work most closely with, you know, the you know, product managers, the designers, the engineers, I mean, just a phenomenal, a phenomenal group of people that I've really enjoyed working with, have learned a ton from. Um, so definitely uh, net positive on the product <laughs> management experience um, at Full Story. I would say, you know, very few people, um, I think, uh, you know, growing up say, I want to be a product manager, right? And so folks find themselves getting into product in different ways, um, multiple ways to get into product management. I think one thing that I think works well and you know, worked well for me uh, personally was um, you know, working in an organization where there is a product team and working closely with that team, um, one, to learn more about what it's like to be a PM and then the skills that make someone successful, um, and also to, to sort of help that team you know, in whatever skill set you end up you know, potentially mm -hmm. having. 
And then just making sure that you understand enough about what it means to be a PM. Um, and then you kind of slowly, slowly make your way over. Um, I've seen that work many times, um, not just for myself. And so that's uh, the advice I would give to anybody is if you're interested in product management, you know, make sure that you raise your hand, uh, make sure that you are you know, doing your due diligence um, and working closely with that team. Um, uh, and that's definitely one way to <laughs> one way yeah, to make it into product. One management. way to do it. I think that's why I, I went back and was kind of watching the session with uh, Tommy and Hannah. They were kind of talking about his journey in, and like he said, like no one wakes up thinking they want to do this. Exactly. And, you know, <laughs> you found his way in through consulting. Your background is in engineering. Um, what if you're like a super experienced PM and maybe you're just looking for a different work environment, something mm -hmm. a little bit different? Um, is full story hiring for people oh. of, <laughs> of that caliber at the moment? Oh my moment. gosh, I'm so glad you that, and that was not planted. Absolutely. So we are, I mean, a full story is very much a rocket ship, um, as you know, and so the product team is absolutely growing. And so, yes, if you happen to be a kick ass PM, um, we're definitely, uh, definitely looking for, for kick ass PMs. Yeah. So, yeah. Check out uh, fullstory.com slash jobs. And, uh... We do have an audience question. Oh, okay. Oh, we have an audience question come in. Um, all right. Oh, okay. So Shiv is asking, can you define with examples how you find friction in onboarding? I'm going to try to answer this real quick. Um, I so I, I I use full story to look for examples of friction in my onboarding, and I literally just build like the biggest funnel ever from sign up to getting your magic moment, which it can be getting your script installed, or it could also be just talking to a salesperson if that's how you prefer to buy. Um, and then I look for the errors and the rage clicks. That's kind of my process. Um, in a checkout flow, uh, other things, ways that you identify friction, maybe an onboarding sign up ideas, mm -hmm. things I missed. Yeah, no, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's definitely um, a great way to find areas of friction. Um, that's absolutely just the drop off to yeah. where the drop off points are. Yeah. And in order to do that, you just you need a funnel. So whether or not you're using a full story funnel or some other analytics tool, you know, big funnels, you just and I build it all the steps in and then look for where the dips are and then you can kind of slice and dice from there. Yeah, and you can always just watch customers, just sit next to them and see yeah. what they're doing and um, ask questions. Do um, a little traditional yeah. research. <laughs> but if you want to do this at, you know, two in the morning, that's, yeah. that's not an option. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. yes. Um, usually, yeah. usually not an option. Um, somebody mentioned, uh, a comment we got from somebody was that prototyping tools like Azure are really successful. Have you used something like that before? Oh, absolutely. Huge fan of prototyping, multiple tools tools that you, know, you can use uh, for that. But that's another really great way to get feedback from customers um, quickly before yeah. you build the thing. Um, so yeah, we're, we build use, your we prototype do yes. in Azure or InDesign or whatever it is that InVision, you Figma. In, InVision, yeah. that's what I'm thinking. InDesign yeah. is something else. Um, Figma, yeah, whatever those are. And or draw it on a piece of paper. Yeah, <laughs> paper prototype. Low fatality pro prototype uh, has never led me astray. I think, or, I think that might be all of our audience questions. Um, we are getting kind of close to time, so if you have, I'm gonna look for like one like last minute. If you have something like a burning desire, <laughs> something you're thinking about, and you want to comment it in, I'm gonna give it just a second before we wrap up. And I think too, you know, the conversation does not end here. So if you have ideas, things come up after um, this re recording, or you're visiting this later, you can always comment. Uh, send a comment on Full Stories LinkedIn feed. We watch that. Um, pretty regularly, or send us a tweet. We have a whole team of huggers that help us respond to our tweets. So uh, we're always interested to hear from customers and, and just folks who mm -hmm. are doing this about what's working for them. So reach out. Um, and if there are no other questions, then what I'll do is just kind of close it up. So I can tell you, I just want to say thank you so much thank for you. sitting here with me today. This was really fun. It was like a kind of a good break in the workflow. Um, I'm going to, do you have any like final thoughts, like last parting? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, uh, parting Message. thoughts. I mean, this has been great, right? And, and to your point, the conversation doesn't stop here. Um, and so, you know, definitely, if anyone has comments or questions or ways that you know they think about this that might be different, um, I would love to learn more. I'm always looking to learn. So yeah, um, challenge definitely. us. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, great. Well, and then um, yeah, I think that's it. Like, leave your comments, follow us on LinkedIn, stay in touch with Full Story. We've got content like this shipping out all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Molly. Let's get back to it. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>